Welcome to our overview for Sunday School Teachers and Bible Study Leaders of LifeWay's Explore the Bible lesson for 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 for May 15, 2022, with the title, Observing. One way you could begin this lesson would be to ask or, or to, to share a story or ask your class, did you ever miss out on something that you really wanted to see or do? For example, when I was a boy, our family went to the Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C. I loved dinosaurs back then. I couldn't wait to see the big uh, skeletons that are on display there. But at, just after we entered, I got separated from my parents somehow. And then I thought I heard, I was just a, a child, but I thought I heard an announcement saying everybody had to leave and they were closing. So obediently, I left and went out front and I just sat there on the steps. And I sat there, I don't know how long, uh, ended up it wasn't time to leave. Uh, but I, I met, sat there and missed out on the whole thing till it was time to close down. My parents asking the security guards to try to find me. It was just a mess. But for years, I always regretted missing out. Man, I missed out on something I really wanted to do. Rest of the story, as an adult, I went back and I got my picture taken sitting on those steps where I was. I got my revenge and got to see those dinosaurs after all. But you or your class members might share some times when you felt like you missed out on something you really wanted to do, something fun or uh, some place or some event. We all know it's a bad feeling to think you've missed out. Well, that brings us to the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. Here in the sequel, uh, as well as in 1 Thessalonians, Paul addresses the Thessalonians' concerns about the return of the Lord. In the first letter, he dealt with their concerns about their deceased loved ones, that somehow they had missed out on the return of the Lord when, when they died. He assured them this wasn't the case. But now here in 2 Thessalonians, he's dealing with their concerns that they themselves had missed out on the, the day of the Lord, that, uh, that, that it had somehow taken place and that they had missed it. You see that in verses 1 and 2 where Paul says, Now we request you, brethren, in regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So here you see the problem. Someone had told the Thessalonians, the Lord's come and you've missed it. Uh, this was something Jesus predicted would happen in Matthew 24. He said people are going to say, hey, here's the Christ. He, he's over there. He said, don't believe them. He said in the next verses, his coming is going to be very obvious. It's going to be like lightning flashing. Paul talks about it in, in 1 Thessalonians 4. It's going to be a trumpet. We're going to be gathered. You're not just going to miss it like that. It's not going to happen. Now, before we get into some of the next verses, which may cause some discussion on, on what they teach, I, I think one of the things we may need to make clear here, Paul is talking about the return of the Lord for his people. Notice what the text says here. He says he's talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word coming here is the, the Greek Bible word parousia, which means appearance or coming. We see this word again in verse 9. Uh, and then he calls it our gathering together to him. So he says it's about the coming of our Lord and our gathering together to him. So it's very clear here. He's talking about what some people call the rapture or the return of the Lord for his people. The Thessalonians were evidently troubled by false teaching that this had taken place and they had missed it. Well, this deception that the Lord had already come back has somehow has been going on all through history in, in one form or another. President McKinley was shot and killed by an assassin, Charles Guito, on July 2nd, 1881. Among other things, Guito had been a traveling preacher of sorts, teaching the Lord had already returned in 70 AD. He said whenever he would hear someone looking off into the future for the return of the Christ, he would say, hold, it occurred 1800 years ago. So teachings like this have been around all through history. The Lord has returned in, in some kind of way, not publicly, not visibly, like the angel said in Acts 1 that he would. And the Thessalonians were troubled by it. So Paul's comforting them by what he uh, teaches in verses 3 through 5. He says, here's the truth. He says, let no one and anyone deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes a seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Then he says, do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? Paul says to them, you shouldn't be deceived by these people. Remember what I already taught you about the return of the Lord for us. He basically says two things have to happen first. Now, at this point in the lesson, you might just point your class to the text. Let them read it. Let them answer a couple of questions. What does Paul say has to happen before the Lord returns? It's really clear. Number one, he says there has to be an apostasy, uh, which means a falling away 
as what that word means. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.1 says, But the Spirit explicitly says in later times many will fall away, meaning that word apostasy, fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. So one thing that has to happen first is a falling away from the faith in, in the world. And two, he says the man of lawlessness must be revealed. That's the second thing. So who is this? Uh, again, what you might do is just have your class look at this, look at these verses. What all do these verses teach us about this man? Uh, and just have just list them out on the blackboard or dry, dry erase board or everything, everything that, uh, that that you all can see. It says he's a man of lawlessness or, or sin. He is a son of destruction. He makes himself to be God over everyone or everything else. He sits in the temple of God, making himself God. And after you list all these things, you might say, who do you think this sounds like? Kind of sounds like the Antichrist, doesn't it? So what's Paul saying here? He says, don't be afraid the Lord has returned. He, he, he hasn't. He says he won't come until you see a great falling away from the true faith and the man of lawlessness, the, the Antichrist, revealed in the temple. Well, I don't know what your theory of the end times is, and I know a lot of people have different ideas about it, and I'll be the first to say, uh, I don't have it all figured out. If you do, I'm happy for you. But whatever theory you have, it, it needs to fit with what Paul says here, doesn't it? And he's, he's really very clear. He says, the Lord hasn't come, and you know he hasn't come because you haven't seen these two things happen yet. So we need to make sure that our theories and beliefs, whatever they are, line up with what the Word of God says. And his word here is very clear. Honestly, I'm not sure why these verses in 2 Thessalonians are not more prominent in, in Christian teaching today because they're very simple and, and very clear. Maybe it's because they don't fit into some of our preconceived ideas for the end times or, or what. I, I don't know. And depending on, I'm, I'm sure you may get some questions or comments about, uh, about what these verses teach. And I would just ask, you know, can you think of another explanation for, for what these verses teach? They, they, they seem pretty clear. Now, uh, one thing I would, I would say, uh, all Scripture has to fit together. And, and there are, are some other Scriptures that teach about the end times that do challenge us. So all this should keep us humble, and it should keep us from becoming too dogmatic about our end times beliefs. I love what our Baptist faith and message statement says about the end times. And you, you may want to mention this in your class Sunday. Our Baptist faith and message statement says, the Lord in his own time and in his own way will bring about the end. That's all you've got to believe to be a Southern Baptist. Just to believe the Lord will come in his own time, in his own way. You don't have to have a particular theory about the end time to be a Southern Baptist. And I, I like that statement. What a person believes about the end times has never been a test of fellowship for us as Southern Baptists. And we don't want to be contentious. And don't let this happen in your class Sunday. Don't let things become contentious or argumentative. But remember the statement, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, diversity, and in all things, charity. Let, let's love each other. Let, let's foster a culture of love and tolerance for each other on these things. But the passage is definitely very interesting, and I think it definitely deserves more of our attention in uh, Christian end times teaching. Well, I'll let you deal with some of those things as, you, as God leads you to in your class. Well, let's get away from theories and make some application for today. If the Bible says the Lord's not going to come until the apostasy comes first, what do we see today that might indicate that there is an apostasy happening? Can, can we see apostasy? Can we see falling away from the faith, like Paul talks about in 1 Timothy uh, 4, uh, happening today? And so you might ask your class here, what do you see happening in our town, in our state, in our nation, in our world that might indicate a falling away from the faith has already begun? I, I think you could come up with many. Uh, for example, just this last week, the, the United Methodist Church announced that they are not united anymore because of divisions over the issue of homosexuality. A conservative group is uh, splitting off to form the, the global Methodist Church. Uh, the division began over the denomination's historic teaching that, quote, the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching, end quote. So that's just a, a basic Christian teaching. But now the United Methodist Church, mainline Christian denomination for almost two centuries or around two centuries, is abandoning that clear teaching. That is a sign, certainly, of apostasy. We see the same thing in the Anglican Episcopal churches where they're ordaining homosexual priests and officiating so-called gay marriages. It's clearly against the word of God and a falling away. And I don't mean to just pick on any one sin. Just that there is nothing 
more clear in the Word of God, both Old Testament and New Testament, that homosexual practice is forbidden by the Lord. You throw that out, that, that's so clear. You're basically tossing out the whole authority of the Word of God. That's why this is such a watershed issue. And I think as the, the pressure to accept homosexuality increases in the days ahead, this is going to be an issue that is going to test the faithfulness of many of us to the Word of God. You're going to stand for what God says, or you're going to fall away with the rest of them. It's going to test us. So let, let's be determined. We are not going to fall away. We are going to stand on the clear Word of God. But we are certainly seeing many fall away in, in, in many ways, not just one. We talked about hell last week. A recent Pew Research survey said only 58% of Americans believe in hell anymore. And even worse, 18% of those who call themselves evangelical Christians say they don't believe in hell anymore. One out of five almost evangelical Christians say they don't believe in hell. That's definitely an apostasy of falling away from the true faith. You can think of others. Your class can think of others. Standards we used to have that we don't hold anymore. Beliefs people used to have that they don't believe in anymore. So you can definitely make a case. We are seeing what Paul is talking about here in 2 Thessalonians 2 unfolding. Uh, there is an apostasy. All it takes now is for an antichrist to arise and with the world events the way they are, that could happen at any time. So there's a whole lot there. I don't know if you'll get past that on, on Sunday morning, but let, let's look at the last section after go, going through all this. Paul tells them in verse five, do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? He's saying this is so clear. He says, I told you this. Don't, don't be deceived about it. Then in verses 6 through 12, he talks some more about that man of sin or the, what we would probably think of as the Antichrist. What, what does he teach us here? Well, several things we see in, in these uh, next verses. He says in verse 6, this one is being restrained so that in his time he may be revealed. Evidently, Satan's ready to start his wicked work, but God's spirit and power is holding him back until the appointed time. He says in verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. There's a mystery. There's things about it we don't understand. That's why we got to be humble about these things. He said, but the, the machinery is in motion right now. It's coming. God's going to continue to hold him back until he says so, which, folks, is another great point of application here that should comfort us. Satan cannot do everything he wants to do. God has got him on a leash. He, he, he's holding him back. It reminds me of Mark 5 where, where Jesus meets the garrison demoniac and the, the demons ask Jesus permission to go into the pigs. It says he gave them permission. I just love that. It shows us so powerfully Jesus is in charge. The demons are subject to our Lord. Even the Antichrist, as powerful and wicked as he is, can do nothing. He can start nothing in this world until God gives him permission to begin. So we can be very confident even if we go into some tumultuous end days, God is on the throne. And notice another evidence of God's power here. When God does unleash him, as verse 8 says, it says, Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. See how powerful the Lord is here? He's going to slay this Antichrist, that verse 9 says, without power and signs and false wonders. And how's he going to slay him? Not with a great angelic army or anything. It just says, with the breath of his mouth. He's just going to say the word, and that evil one will be done. As the old song says, have faith in God. He's on the throne. And another note, <clears throat> the word coming here in verse 9, which says the Lord will bring him to an end by the appearance of his coming. It's the same Greek Bible word, parousia, that is used in verse 1, where Paul talks about the coming, the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. According to this text, that's all going to happen at the same time. Well, then verses 10 to 12 conclude this section, if you get to it, uh, talking about how deceptive the Antichrist will be. Verse 10 says he'll have all the deception of wickedness. Verse 11 says because they chose to disbelieve, God will send a deluding influence on them to, to believe uh, his falsehoods. And it says they're going to perish, as verse 10 says, and be judged, as verse 12 says. If you have time, you might talk about the unreliable nature of signs and wonders. Many Christians like to focus on signs and wonders and things like that. Jesus warned them against them in his day, and I'm sure he is the same today. But here's the thing. If we base our faith on signs and wonders instead of the clear teaching of the word of God, what's going to happen when the man of sin comes? 
What's going to happen when the Antichrist comes? With all the power and signs and false wonders, as verse 9 says. Many people are going to follow him. Just a good reminder. We need to base our faith on the clear teaching of the Word of God, not signs and wonders that can be so deceptive and effectively used by the enemy. And especially in what may well be these last days, we need to encourage our class members Hold fast to the Word of God. Let's be committed to read it every day, know what it says so we won't be deceived. Most importantly, practice it and cling to it no matter what happens. Let's keep our eyes on the Lord, whom this passage definitely teaches is in charge. He is on the throne. Antichrist can't come till he says so, and when he comes, our Lord is going to slay him just with the breath of his mouth. I love the picture of Revelation 19 that portrays the return of the Lord on a white horse, his eyes a flame of fire, a sword in his mouth to, to smite the nations. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let the hallelujah chorus begin. Let's keep our eyes on him and let's be faithful to his word until that day. I'm going to sure be praying for you this week. Remember, if you put something in the comment section below, I'll pray for you and your group by name this Saturday and Sunday morning. And also, instead of searching for this video every week, if you'd like to be automatically notified when a new video gets posted, hit the subscribe button on this YouTube uh, page, and they'll notify you when the next lesson comes out. I hope that will be a help to you. See you next time, Lord willing.